Good afternoon, everybody. It's absolutely wonderful to see so many people here from all reaches of the theater and opera to acknowledge a wonderful artist and fabulously individual human being. Ralph and I did a Macbeth together for Scottish Opera at the Edinburgh Festival with an elevated walkway surrounded by gauze wings, a characteristically elegant Ralph construction, and later a production of Smetana's Dalibor. Now, Dalibor is a sort of Czech Fidelio. The hero is an imprisoned freedom fighter with very prominent musical roles for a solo violinist and harp, appropriately enough. So the strings of the instruments became the bars of the prison and the harp was placed center stage on a black walkway which resembled the fingerboard of a violin. But the harp was goldish, as harps tend to be. And this bothered Ralph, who sought and was refused permission to spray the base of the harp <laughs> so that it blended with the fingerboard. The refusal was one thing, but locking the harp away in a special dressing room was a fatal provocation. <laughs> When I came to the theater for the opening night, I was met by the ashen-faced conductor, a small man not overburdened with a sense of humor, and informed in tones of biblical outrage that Ralph had unpicked the lock on the dressing room, unpicked the lock on the harp case, sprayed the said harp, relocked both locks, and left behind only a strong smell of acetate. Various apoplectic officials came and went meeting out to Ralph the terrifying news that he was not welcome to take a curtain call for his pains, all of which melted away when the curtain rose on the perfectly sprayed harp and the broadest and most wicked of Ralph grins spread across his unforgettably roguish face. In 1997, Ralph and I created a production of Verdi's Simone Bocanegra for Welsh National Opera, for which Ralph developed a design as aesthetically satisfying as it was technically accomplished, a more refined and eloquent version of the two walls principle. And in 2016, we further developed this to realize what I think was his final theater design, the Beaumarchais trilogy we were planning at WNO, The Barber of Seville, The Marriage of Figaro, and the newly written sequel, Inevitably Figaro Gets a Divorce. They encapsulated his magnificent achievements over a lifetime, the lucid evocation of a key idea expressed through a very refined aesthetic sense and superbly eloquent engineering. Thank you. And now Sarah will tell us about how her father was responsible for getting Ralph into the Central School of Art and how it all started. <laughs> Before becoming a student at the Central School of Arts and Crafts, now Central St. Martins, Ralph had attended the Epsom College of Art. In 1948, when he applied to Central, Jeanetta Cochran, then head of theatre design, was on extended leave following a serious accident. Standing in for her was my father, Maurice Kestelman, RA, later head of fine art at Central. Before the war, my father had designed a number of theatre productions, including Carmen, for Tyrone Guthrie at Sadler's Wells, and immediately after the war, for the Old Vic at the New Theatre under the artistic triumvirate of Laurence Olivier, Ralph Richardson, and John Burrell. I think it fair to say that all of us who knew Ralph over the years would describe him as a man full of confidence and self-belief. But in spite of brimming with brilliant and innovative ideas, it seems that as a student he struggled, uncertain how to fully identify himself and his talent. I don't know any of the detail of their work together or their discussions, but apparently it was Morris who inspired Ralph to have belief in himself as an artist, opening his eyes to the wider world, introducing him to composition, color, and art. Ralph called it an awakening. It was a huge pleasure to my father, still head of fine art, when Ralph was appointed head of theater design himself from 1965 to 1971. Both men, head of departments alongside one another, sharing a deep intellectual bond and cultural background, both Jewish, my father's roots Russian and Polish, Ralph's Hungarian and German. I worked with Ralph myself on several productions which thrilled my father, and he told me then how impressive and inspiring Ralph's student portfolio had been 
and how full of admiration he was for all Ralph's brilliant success. We held a special one-day memorial exhibition celebrating my father following his death. Ralph paid a most moving tribute and ended it by saying, I owe everything to Maurice Kestelman. Everyone here today will be speaking of Ralph's astonishing vision and gift and the unique mark he made on 20th and 21st century theater. I feel deeply honored to have worked with him and to have known him just a little as a friend but I am especially proud and touched by the profound influence that my father had in helping the great Ralph Koltai realize and believe in the great artist he was to become. I have never in my life in the work in the theatre made a decision. Everything I've done has been intuitive and has come from the imagination of what I felt like doing. So I wasn't aware of the fact that I was breaking a boundary because I never had a boundary. When I entered the theatre, it was intuitively, it happened by chance. Everything in my life has basically by chance, and any talent I have is recognizing the accident when it happens and then pursuing it. And we're going to follow that inimitable interview with uh, Judith Aronson's photographs that she took uh, as a commission of, about Ralph's work. I've often said I'd have paid the telegraph for this job rather than being paid. I, I think it was probably the best job I've ever had in my whole career. Koltai invited me to his studio and then to his home, both places of wonder. In the 1970s, my contemporaries had liked the informality of entertaining on a rug on the floor, some of us with an image of Marilyn Monroe in the room. But nothing could compare to the thrill of watching Koltai on the set a few days before opening night of The Tempest. The consummate gentleman, Koltai directed everybody, the props craftsmen, the costume designers, fitters, then the stagehands. It was obvious he enjoyed his job. No sniping, always cordial, lots of jokes, Everyone was pleased to be in his company. For the Tempest opening scene, a large 15-foot wave was created from plywood covered in patent leather that stretched out across the stage. A scale model of every detail was on hand for checking proportions, color, materials, and position. For Ariel's entrance, a trapeze was concocted to fly him in from the void above the curtain riggings. None of us could believe our ears as we sat waiting for some test action when we heard Ian Charlson, Ariel, refuse to try out the trapeze. The insurance hadn't begun yet. A little kerfuffle but then who should lift off from the stage into the rafters behind a shimmering scrim but the master himself, a considerably less acrobatic man than Charlson. There was a delighted murmur amongst those of us watching. Without a snag, a safe landing was achieved. Thank you. Michael Billington, the critics viewpoint. I once rather rashly picked out three basic trends in British theatre design over the past 70 years. The immediate post-war movement, which favoured elaborate decoration, then came a period heavily influenced by the Berliner Ensemble, dispensing with canvas, deploying modern materials, highlighting conceptual ideas. And that eventually led to the high-tech eclecticism of today's world. Well, Ralph, working in drama and opera, was an absolutely key figure in that middle period. He once told me in an interview that he thought of himself as a painter 
who instead of working in canvas, treated the play itself as an art object. And I would say his genius was, was for finding the right visual language for a particular work and for matching the design to the play. And I'd like to pick out three examples of that uh, where you see Ralph's method matching perfectly the work itself. The first is a design that Ralph described as one of his own favorites, and that was for David Jones's production of The Tempest at Chichester in 1968. It's a play that offers a huge challenge to any director and designer, and in the early 1950s, the great temptation, as at a Loudoun St. Hill set at Stratford, I remember, was to treat the play as a kind of glorified MGM spectacle or Las Vegas floor show. What Ralph did at Chichester was the opposite. He banished gaudiness and turned Prospero's island into an alternative world. He turned the, that extraordinary Chichester hexagonal stage into a saucer shape. Uh, he used a white revolving disc that reflected the play's imagery and even created a globe that at one point opened up to reveal Ferdinand and Miranda playing chess. Everything about that design had a pristine whiteness clarity, and showed the island to be a place of magic. And those ideas also percolated his astonishing design for Bernard Shaw's Back to Methuselah at the National Theatre at the Old Vic in 1969. I mean, Shaw's play, one has to say, is pretty much impossible. Shaw called it a metabiological Pentateuch. Um, <laughs> it moves from Adam and Eve to 3000 AD. It makes incredible demands uh, on the designer and the director but they were demands which both Ralph's design and Clifford Williams's production met. There was an absolutely unforgettable opening image of atoms and planets whirling in the cosmos, of the earth revolving around a glowing sun and then turning into the tree of knowledge. And later we saw beautiful crystal spheres repeatedly descending from the heavens. But Ralph did not only create engrossing images, he actually enhanced Shaw's text. He once told me that many of his ideas, which involved radar screens, black plexiglass chambers, golden planets, all sprang from a 25-minute conversation with Laurence Olivier in the National Theatre Canteen. And while Ralph was a creative artist in his own right, as I said, he was deeply responsive to hints from directors. When he first met Terry Hans to discuss a Royal Shakespeare company, Cyrano de Bergerac, Terry told him, that he felt the play was an opera. Well, that opened a clue, or gave Ralph several clues. Uh, and as he told me, it meant creating five distinct scenes for that play in the simplest way possible. So for the second scene in Ragano's Bakery, he didn't want mountains of loaves and pastry. Instead, Ralph seized on the idea that Ragano was a poet and symbolized that with a golden chair that for the baker became a sacred seat of composition. And I'd say even more astonishing was the design for the fourth act battle scene. Ralph simply evoked that through the basic image of a tent and a flag. And again, he told me he took his inspiration from the statue of American soldiers raising the flag at Iwo Jima in the Second World War. So what we saw on stage was a 27-foot-high Gascon flag being put up by eight men to evoke a sense of physical struggle. I hope I've said enough to show that Ralph combined the instincts of an innovative artist with the ability to find the appropriate visual metaphor for a dramatist's text. He once said to me, I try and find ways of introducing art into theater, and occasionally I get somewhere near. And I think that's a reflection both of his essential modesty and his belief that theatrical design should be as exciting and exploratory and as innovative as anything seen in a contemporary gallery. I would say his contribution to post-war design was both striking and profound, and it's something for which we should all be extremely grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Now, Nick Kent is going to talk to us about painting a bridge. The government had unexpectedly released funds for the regeneration of the Kilburn High Road. And we managed to persuade Railtrack, as it was then, to join in and do something creative 
with a large 19th century railway bridge, which had spanned the Kilburn High Road. Well, always start at the top, so at the spur of the moment, I thought that a commission like this might really appeal to Ralph. Little did I know what I was taking on. Ralph came to look at the bridge and have lunch with me. He was very intrigued with this public commission. The money was derisory, but his enthusiasm was infectious. I gave him the brief and said that rail track had made it quite clear to me we could not, under any circumstances, deviate from a simple geometric scheme. He said he quite understood and went away to draw up some ideas and he'd get back to me. A couple of weeks later, the most stunning designs arrived on my desk. The concept completely ignored the brief. <laughs> it could not be executed by railway, rail track contractors and essentially needed a scenic artist to work for three weeks on scaffolding above the Kilburn High Road and even involved diverting some traffic on this main artery into London. So you can imagine the health and safety implications. In essence, it was the painting of a beautiful light blue sky skein on the south side of the bridge. And on the north side, a dark night sky. Trying to get rail track to agree to allow this ha to happen took five months of negotiations, but the result was a much-loved local landmark. Only a genius like Ralph could have so stubbornly refused to allow his, division, his vision to be compromised by regulations and practicalities. And in so doing, it gave birth to a design so original and so loved throughout Kilburn. Thank you. And now Pamela is going to talk to us about Ralph Contai, the sculptor. We tried many times to get a fine art gallery to give Ralph a one-man show of his sculptural works. He waited 42 years. In 2016, when Ralph was 92, the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, through the inspired idea of Sean Crowley, Director of Drama, where I'm currently International Chair in Drama, invited me to curate an exhibition in the Lindbury Gallery at Royal Welsh College of Ralph's collected sculptural works. The exhibition was entitled Atomic Landscape, and it was to coincide with Ralph's final stage work, The Figaro Trilogy, at Welsh National Opera, directed by David Pountney. To keep with Ralph's wish to create a specific environment for the collection of metal collages, the wonderful scenic workshops at Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama created the textured stone walls at Foncluse. Koltai was always fascinated by the materiality of objects. His theatre and fine art practice explores his instinctive ability to juxtapose different surfaces and structures, and actually they need no narrative. These compositions exude their own elusive atmosphere, and they prompt the viewer to ponder on their history and meaning. Koltai turns perceptions upside down. Collages are normally associated with paper, but they've become atomized metal. Those sculptural, which we think of as three-dimensional, hang on a wall as three-dimensional constructions. His keen, sharp eye finds not only the material objects, but carefully selects only part of them. Thus, he alters the scale of the original pieces of rusty, pitted, and broken-edged metal into mysterious black holes and fissures. A round ball is placed floating in this unearthly universe. Within deep cavities of the surface, an occasional violent accent of colour draws the viewer's eye to wander over the eruptions or simply 
to marvel at the natural beauty of organic decompositions that he has selected for our attention. The works are tactile, seductive, and intriguing. Collage sculptural collages are aptly summed up in the words of Sir Anthony Sher, a great theatre designer and now a great abstract artist. On leaving the exhibition, Ralph, with Sean Crowley and Jane Coltai, turned to me and said, this is all I've ever wanted. Thank you. I realized I could volunteer for the army because I couldn't be called up. I was an enemy alien. And, but I could volunteer. And I volunteered for the British army and I was accepted into what was then, hasn't existed for a very long time anymore, the Royal Army Service Corps. And one day, a non-commissioned officer came into the room we're invoking. I was, uh, we were being trained in clerical work um, for that section of the Royal Army Service Corps, and came in and said, anybody here can type German? Up went my hand. I was posted to Nuremberg. I was attached to British intelligence in Nuremberg. I was still basically in my army private uniform. I, had, I didn't have a rank. I can still give you the names of all 21 <laughs> accused from Göring and the front row left to von Papen, the ambassador who was acquitted um, in Ankara during the period of the Hitler regime and I can still run through the 21 names now if you ask me but they they were all morons except for Göring Göring was a very intelligent man but the others were not the other 20 were not um, yes maybe Schacht the finance minister wasn't stupid and Schacht and von Papen actually got acquitted but I still in my drawer, 10 years from here, I have my, mem my, my entry cards into a blue one with my photograph into the courthouse and the gold one into the court itself, uh, which is like a credit card that you have from the bank that allowed me into a gold one into the court and the most precious one is a sheet of paper that permitted me to go into the court on the first hearing of, of the sentence on the accused. The very first hearing when the judges had reached the conclusion of who should be freed, which was only von Papen and Schacht, the finance minister, and the ambassador in Ankara, were the only two accused. People like Albert Speer, whom you will know about, and Czerny has written a book about him and so on, got various sentences. But the majority were actually executed by hanging by Pierre Pont, who complained that he never had to execute six people on the same day previously. At the end, I was transferred to Warcrimes Interrogation Centre, London District Cage, Kensington Palace Gardens, Bayswater. And there, my task was to look, try and locate those responsible as assassins of the public around Europe. And I found people. 
and I've I found people, and I've actually got one of the names so that I don't forget it. There was an Obersturmbannführer Knöchlein, who was actually responsible for killing 76 out of 78 British troops who were cut off by the German SS from reaching Dunkirk for evacuation. Knöchlein was prosecuted and executed.